religious liberty. African American leaders speak out in support for the Colorado Baker at the center of a Supreme Court battle. Mattis in the Philippines. The U.S. Defense Secretary meets with his Southeast Asian counterparts to discuss North Korea. The Holy Father greets people with special needs and highlights their dignity. We'll have a report from Rome. And the Medal of Honor, a retired Army captain who's Catholic gets the big award. On EWTN News Nightly for Monday, October 23rd, 2017. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. African-American leaders, some of them, are defending a Christian baker from Colorado who refused to make a cake for a gay wedding. The case will take center stage at the Supreme Court in December. That's where we find correspondent Jason Calvi this evening. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Lauren. It's the due date for the lawyers for the couple to file their counter arguments with the Supreme Court. They say the baker is discriminating against gay people, and they say it harkens back to companies who refused to serve blacks during the Jim Crow era. But a group of black Christians stood right here in defense of the Colorado baker. We have your back, Jack. African American leaders stand up for Jack Phillips, a Christian baker. No person should be forced by the government to violate his or her conscience. No one should be forced out of business and having his livelihood destroyed just because of what they believe. Phillips serves up sweet treats in the Denver suburbs. It's a place where you get artistic cakes. Wedding cakes used to be 40% of his business. Now to avoid fines, he doesn't sell them anymore. The state uh, ordered me to create cakes for same-sex weddings which is something that goes against the core of who I am and all the uh, things that I believe in. The ACLU represents the gay couple who claims Phillips was discriminating. If a bakery chooses to open its doors to the public, it can't pick and choose who it will serve based on sexual orientation or any other characteristic of the customer. The couple's supporters link what they faced to the Jim Crow era's refusal to serve blacks. But black civil rights leaders like Clarence Henderson say it's not the same. I just wasn't recognized as being a human being. He grew up in the segregated South. I sat there at that lunch counter with my life being threatened simply because I was black. Phillips says he'll serve anyone, including gay customers, but he won't create just any cake. Jack won't bake cakes that celebrate Halloween. He won't bake cakes with a racist slur. He's refused to design a cake for a person's divorce. The person wanted just like half of a wedding cake, and he, um, he, he declined to make that cake because of his religious beliefs. Jack Phillips' attorneys are also presenting this case as a free speech issue that the government is trying to force an artist to create art in a certain way. Lauren, the ACLU says not every creative job should be exempt from non-discrimination laws. Jason, we can expect this to hit the Supreme Court later this year? The Supreme Court will have oral arguments for this case in December. We expect their decision by the end of the term in June, and they'll be looking at the briefs filed in this case, including from a number of Catholic groups in support of the Baker, including U.S. Bishops Conference, Catholic Vote, as well as the Thomas More Society. Correspondent Jason Calvi, thank you so much. Attorneys for a pregnant teen being held in a Texas immigration facility are asking a federal appeals court to reconsider its decision not to order the government to let her obtain an abortion. A three-judge panel ruled Friday the government should be given more time to try to release the teen so she can obtain that abortion outside of custody. President Trump welcomes the leader of Singapore to the White House today. Prime Minister Lee Si-yen Lung met the president at the Oval Office. The pair also had a working lunch today. He announced that Singapore's purchase of nearly $14 billion worth of Boeing aircraft will happen. Trump says the move will create 70,000 U.S. jobs. President Donald Trump presents the Medal of Honor to a retired Army captain for conspicuous gallantry during his service in the Vietnam War. 
Today, Captain Gary Michael Rose becomes the 19th combat medic to receive the medal. White House correspondent Mark Irons was at the ceremony. He joins us now. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. Rose lives in Huntsville, Alabama, where he is active with the Knights of Columbus in his retirement. But it's for his actions in Laos during 1970s Operation Tailwind that he has now become the 69th living soldier to receive the Medal of Honor for actions in the Vietnam War. It's been 47 years since Army Captain Gary Michael Rose tended to wounded soldiers during the Vietnam War. And today, he's in the East Room of the White House with the President. This summer, he learned he would finally receive the prestigious award for his bravery. Please hold for the President of the United States. Receiving a congratulatory phone call from the President in August. I came to classic military attention. I had the phone in my left hand, my 45 degree angles on my feet, my fingers curled, my thumb along the seam of my pants, and all I could get out was, yes, Mr. President, thank you, Mr. President, yes, Mr. President. In September 1970, Rose was a medic with the 5th Special Forces Group. His work was secret. It was on a mission deep in enemy territory in Laos that Operation Tailwind took place. Rose and the soldiers with him came under heavy gunfire and were stranded. On the fourth day of the mission, as they were being extracted, the helicopter Rose was on went down. He ignored his own injuries and tended to the wounded, including one Marine who suffered serious trauma to his neck. He was just bleeding like a stuck pig. At that time, I was out of anything, so I, I think I stiffened his neck up by pulling some uh, bandanas, and that's what I was using to help him with. Rose saved his life. The Marine lived 42 more years, dying in 2012. The fact that he lived all the way to 2012, that just gives me a, a really a great sense of accomplishment that, that I give credit to the people that trained me, that I, I was able to do something to, in spite of his injuries to, to keep him so he could go home. And he gives all credit to divine intervention. There is no reason why I'm sitting here today. The overwhelming odds that we faced on the ground and the crash. So I got to believe God decided that I was not going to die that day, nor the other people on that helicopter. Rose views the Medal of Honor as a collective award. He says he's receiving it on behalf of the men and women who served alongside him, showing courage and dedication to our nation. Lauren. What an incredible story, Mark. I understand after this, Captain Rose plans to return to his work with groups like the Knights of Columbus and St. Vincent de Paul. Yes, Rose and his wife, Margaret, will return to Huntsville, Alabama later this week after a Hall of Heroes induction ceremony tomorrow at the Pentagon. At home, Rose is very active in charity work, and he says there's really no better feeling that you get at the end of the day when you can think back that you actually made a difference in somebody's life. Lauren. What a great human being. Thank you so much for that powerful story. White House correspondent Mark Irons. Residents will not be allowed to return to the newly freed city of Raqqa for at least two months. A general from the Syrian Democratic Forces says ISIS left behind road mines and booby-trapped buildings. Residents will return once those devices are cleared. U.S.-backed Syrian forces declared victory in Raqqa on Friday. President Trump released a statement praising the work of the Syrian Democratic Forces, saying in part, the defeat of ISIS in Raqqa represents a critical breakthrough in our worldwide campaign to defeat ISIS and its wicked ideology. With the liberation of ISIS's capital, the vast majority of its territory, the end of the ISIS caliphate is in sight. U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson makes an unannounced trip to Afghanistan. Tillerson met with the Afghan president at Bagram Air Force Base in Kabul. They were discussing the Trump administration's new South Asia policy. The Philippine government declares an end to the fighting in the southern city of Marawi five months after it began. It's welcome news for Defense Secretary Jim Mattis as he arrives in the Philippines today. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby joins us with the latest. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. Secretary Mattis is congratulating the Philippine military after its victory over ISIS-inspired militants, but he knows the victory didn't come without a cost, noting the length and difficulty of the siege. It was a very tough fight, as you know, in southern Mindanao, and I think that the Philippine military has sent a very necessary message uh, to the uh, terrorists anywhere. 
Defense Secretary Jim Mattis paving the way for a visit next month by President Trump, praising the Philippine Army. Mattis is kicking off a week-long trip in the Philippines. He's talking security with his counterparts in the region, including the country's defense secretary. No more. There are no more militants inside Marawi City. Lorenzana announcing the military recovered 42 bodies today from the last militant stronghold in the city. In crossing thus far the most serious attempt to export violent extremism and radicalism in the Philippines and in the region, we have contributed to preventing its spread in Asia. The defeat of the terrorists is a relief to the region. Hundreds of militants launched the siege in May in Marawi, a majority Muslim city in the south of the mostly Catholic country. The militants took control of the city's central business district and outlying communities, ransacking banks and shops, looting houses, and smashing statues in the Catholic cathedral, according to the military. Stephen Bucci, a former top Pentagon official and counterterrorism expert, says Islamic extremism has long been a problem in the southern Philippines. He says they've been known for persecuting Christians. This is uh, a big problem. The Philippines has a lot of Catholics who are very, very strong in their Christian faith. When they take that kind of stand or their priests are there with them and it, ISIS catches them, ISIS is going to kill them and generally in horrific ways. Steve Bucci says that the only way to stop the terror group is with a military force. He also says it's important the U.S. continues to try and topple the extremist ideology around the world that gives rise to groups like ISIS. The fighting in Marawi has left more than 1,100 people dead, including more than 160 soldiers and police. Lauren. So often, why we hear about Christian persecution in the Middle East, but what is it really like for Christians in Southeast Asia? Well, in terms of terrorism, Lauren, Christians are often targeted in that part of the world as well. The Malaysian defense minister says the siege is a wake-up call for the region, saying what happened in Marawi can happen anywhere. And, of course, if it's not terrorism, we know of governments like China that crack down on Christians who preach their faith. So many Christians there have to pray in secret. So, yes, Christians do have a tough time in part of Asia as well. Thank you so much, Wyatt Goolsby. Japanese voters cast their ballots in a general election, handing Prime Minister Shinzo Abe a victory. Abe's ruling coalition won a clear majority with more than two-thirds of Parliament's 465 seats. The Prime Minister said the result showed strong support from the people and thanked them for backing stability. Pope Francis meets with the Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem. Theophilus III. During the meeting, the Pope called for increased efforts to achieve peace between Israelis and Palestinians. And the Pope met with people from around the world who have disabilities. They were at the Vatican this weekend for a meeting on how the church can better include them. Our Vatican correspondent, Juliet Lindley, has their story. With the prophet Elijah looking down upon them, Matthew, Lauren and Richard bring to life the Old Testament story. With Matthew as Elijah, Lauren as the angel, Richard as God, and everyone enthusiastic about recreating the rain, the thunder, the earthquake, the floods. Joe Apicella from Sydenham in England has worked with people with special needs all his life. He says reenactments are very effective in bringing the Bible to life. I would say a catechesis of this nature would be important to everyone, whether they have learning difficulties or not. But some people with learning difficulties would find it harder to access a scriptural story just from it being read. Matthew greatly enjoys his role as Elijah. It's my favorite part of all time. Because Elijah is a good man. And Richard tells me he's a keen churchgoer. I uh, go to Mass every day and say a prayer for everyone in the world. I believe in God. I ha always go to uh, communion every Sunday. 27-year-old Sophie has Down syndrome and is equally enthusiastic about taking part in Sunday Mass. If that's of experience, I love going to church mostly to definitely, definitely surfing and, and praying. Experts on disability like Dr. Liam Waldron of Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen, Scotland, says parishioners need to reach out more. And he tells me a small but significant step would be, say, inviting someone with special needs every week for a cup of coffee and a chat. It requires perhaps a little bit of time on the, on the, and the generosity of people to give that time. I always think one hour a week. It's not a lot to ask. 
Indeed, when the Pope met Richard and the other participants in the conference on catechesis and people with disabilities, he said every one of us must love and listen to those with special needs and that the Church must speak up for and protect the dignity of such people. The Holy Father also says the Catholic community should continue to embrace special needs people and that religion teachers should find new ways to include everybody irrespective of their differences. In Rome, Juliet Lindley, EWTN News Nightly. As fears mount over Kenya's presidential election, Pope Francis asks leaders there to work for the common good. In questi giorni seguo con particolare attenzione il Kenya. Speaking Sunday in Rome, the Holy Father asks Kenyan leaders to embrace the path of dialogue to avoid violence and chaos. The election takes place this week. Pope Francis visited that country in 2015. Coming up, the latest on Catalonia's bid for independence. We'll talk to a resident of the region in northeast Spain. And the Pope's message to young Canadians ahead of a Vatican summit on youth. Cari giovani amici canadesi, sono contento di stare un po' con voi. Pope Francis is reaching out to young people in Canada. He sent this video message to a meeting where Canadian bishops are preparing for a synod on the youth, and that will take place next October in Rome. Voters in two Italian regions vote for greater autonomy from central government in Rome. Residents in Lombardy and Veneto took part in referendums yesterday. Voters were not asked if they wanted to break away from Italy, but whether the wealthy regions want more power when it comes to issues like education, security and immigration. Tensions remain high between Spain and Catalonia, the country's northeast region, where some residents want independence. Later this week, the local parliament will debate Spain's plan to take direct control of the region. During a press conference this weekend, Spain's Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy announced plans to activate Article 155 of the Constitution. That allows the central government to intervene in running Catalonia. Joining us now via Skype from Barcelona is Lorenzo Dionis. Welcome back to the program. Thank you very much, Lauren. You live in Catalonia. It's been three weeks since you held a referendum to gain its independence. Describe the mood for us there. The mood is a little quieter because the tension is, has risen a little bit. This means uh, before we are now in, uh, in at an uncertainty in an unknown terrain, uh, whereas before it was a lot of uh, protesting, uh, you know, ones against the others. But now we've come to a point where uh, we've never, as a nation, as a country, we've never come before, which is uh, the triggering of an of the Article 155 of the Spanish Constitution, and nobody knows what that means really. Well, doesn't uh, it? In a excuse me, but. Doesn't it mean that Spain is, that Madrid is saying it is going to take control of Catalonia and, and not allow your independent status? Yes, but let's not forget that we are a democracy and a democracy, as a democracy, we have a, 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 separa a separatism, a separatist, what is it, a division of powers. Uh, and, and this so everything has to be voted. It, it doesn't mean that Mariano Rajoy cannot trigger the uh, leader itself. of Spain, right? Yeah, exactly. The leader of Spain at the moment cannot trigger by himself uh, this this article. It has to be voted, and it has to be go to the senators, and the senators have to vote on Saturday. It, it is a little bit more complicated sure. than just Mariano Rajoy saying that. <laughs> okay. Well, tell me, do you ever think that there is going to be an agreement here? One party. Catalonia voted 90 percent in this referendum to split from Spain, and Spain is saying no way. What's the middle ground? Well, Lauren, Catalonia, that, that uh, I have to... I have to say that that is not entirely true. That 90% that you said that voted, uh, the, it was only a representation of 30% of the total po population of Catalonia. It means that uh, only 30% voted that illegal referendum, and of those 30%, 90% voted yes. So that gives us less than, I don't know, what is it, 27% of the total population uh, in Catalonia. 
and um, it, it's it's not even enough to consider a, a secession from 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 Spain. What it seems like to me is the answer to my question um, is no. It. It is now at the moment, but this would be my point of view. You know, uh, a, a secessionist would actually argue uh, towards a yes. Thank you so much for joining us, keeping us updated on the situation in Catalonia, in Spain. Lorenzo Dionis of Barcelona. Thank you, Loren. Up next, the son of late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia joins us to talk about his new book, Scalia Speaks. And coming together for hurricane relief, the five living former presidents join forces to help raise money. Today is the feast of St. John of Capistrano. He was born in 1386 in the kingdom of Naples. When he was 30, he became a Franciscan and was ordained a priest four years later. He died on this day in 1456. Last year, conservative justice Antonin Scalia passed away unexpectedly, causing a shakeup at the Supreme Court. A new book of his speeches, co-edited by one of his sons, gives a never-before look at a life well lived. Joining us now is Christopher Scalia, the co-editor of Scalia Speaks. Welcome to the program. Thanks a lot, Lauren. It's great to be here. So nice to have you. Did you know about all of these speeches in this book? I only knew about a few of them. Uh, Ed Whalen, uh, the co-editor, and I were both really surprised by just how many speeches he delivered and the, the range of topics he covered in the speeches. It's incredible. It's, it says, reflections on law, faith, and a life well lived, on people and ethnicity, on Christians as Cretans, vocation of a judge, natural law, courage. It goes on and on. But it, it does talk about your father in a way showcases that he was an originalist, mm -hmm. meaning he believed the words of the Constitution should be interpreted as they were originally written. Tell us about him and that, his faith and being a devout Catholic. How did those two intersect? Well, he was always, obviously he was a, he believed strongly in originalism and he believed strongly in his, his Catholic uh, faith, but uh, he makes a point of emphasizing that he was was sure that um, his Catholic faith didn't influence how he judged. He thought that would be inappropriate. He I, had to he had to interpret laws based on what they meant at the time they were written, not what he wanted them to mean as a Catholic. There was a speech in the book where he talks about Roe v. Wade and mm -hmm. how he was embarrassed when people would thank him for that decision because it wasn't due to his belief, but rather constitutional text and tradition. He wrote, my religious faith can give me a personal view on the right or wrong of abortion, but it cannot make a text say yes, where in fact it says no, or a tradition say we permit, where in fact has we forbid. Exactly. He, he thought Roe v. Wade was a poorly decided case, not because he was a Catholic, uh, though as a Catholic, obviously, he had certain views about abortion. But uh, as a judge, he didn't like Roe v. Wade because there is nothing in the Constitution um, making abortion on demand uh, a guaranteed right. He is giving all of these speeches. He was really known for his way with words. There was just a play here at Arena Stage uh, mm -hmm. that was uh, about his life, and an actor, Ed Giro, here he is, uh, actually played him. I went and interviewed him, and he had his mannerisms down like you could not believe. And what I loved about Ed is that he talked about this personal side of mm -hmm. your father and how, what a good man mm -hmm. he was. Tell us about that side of your dad. That, that's, I think, one of the reasons these speeches are so much fun, and his opinions are great, but the speeches are where you really get to see his personality. He was very funny. Uh, he had a great sense of humor. He's a great joke teller, great storyteller. And of course, as you mentioned, he's a man of de devout faith. Um, and all of that comes through in the speeches very vividly. I thought I would just end on this quote that is toward the end of the book, on heroes and friends. And it says, it is the greatest curse of advancing years that our world contracts as friends who cannot be replaced with insights into life that are not elsewhere available to us 
leave us behind. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if this was written for you. Yeah, it's, it's true. There are a number of eulogies and memorials in this collection, and a couple of them he, he mentions his looking forward to meeting these friends again in, in the hereafter, and that really kind of captured how I felt about him reading the speeches. Chris Scalia, thank you so much, co-editor of Scalia Speaks. Finally tonight, all five living former presidents joined forces over the weekend to raise money for hurricane relief efforts. The One America Appeal concert held at Texas A&M University raised $2 million. Barack Obama, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George H. W. Bush, and Jimmy Carter all attended. President Trump addressed the crowd in a taped message. In all, the One America Appeal effort has raised more than $30 million, and every dollar is needed. That does it for us, for all of us here at EWTN News Nightly. To all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night, and God bless you.